The presence of the Lord has been here all weekend long. It has been cool to see God move, but we got to bring our faith to the table this morning. We got to bring our, our praise. We don't come empty handed into the presence of God. As children of God, we don't come empty handed. We come with our praise, we come with our faith. As a symbol of that faith, would you put your hands up with me today? Yes. Maybe you're new to new song here. We like to get it during worship. We don't spectate. We're going to come after it. Our God's too good. He's too faithful. He deserves a praise this morning. Jesus, we worship you. We put our faith in you today. We are unshaken. We are unshaken in the presence of our King. We're unshaken, Lord. We're confident before you. Yeah. Oh, I believe in the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel still makes them broken whole i believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone i believe yeah i believe i believe come on lift this up as i bow before come on there it is i will see in the land i'm living
times to every generation. And look how what the Lord has done. See to the darkness that the light has come. See to the nations. So look how what the Lord. Sing it again. Oh, see to the daughters and sing it to the sons. To every generation.
so grateful this morning because no matter where we go no matter where we've been you have been there every single time we come to you today we approach your throne with our praise father that no matter what we came into this building with this morning we lay it down at your feet and we give you all of our hearts it's our only response father we thank you we praise you we lift up your name today
lift up a shout of praise today. Come on, lift up a shout of praise. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Woo! Come on, the Lord is in this place. Come on, bring him your praise this morning. Lift, lift up both hands. Stretch the room. Come on, lift it up. Fill this room with the atmosphere of his praise. His majesty demands it. His goodness. Woo! His mercy. His grace. It is readily available today. Let your praise flow from your lips. Let your praise flow from his lips. Come on, let's just sit here for a second. Yes, come on. Come here, keep lifting up the name of God. not a machine the Holy Spirit is a person and the presence of God moves upon the praises of his people when we lift our hands when we lift our songs in the middle of the seasons that you're walking through I know many of us are walking through season when you lift your voice and you lift your song in the midst of your season what it does is it invites the Holy Spirit to come in and can't you just sense the love of God in this room today Jesus we acknowledge you Lord we love you we thank you Holy Spirit that you are here and so our response to your presence Lord is an open heart that says come and do whatever you want to do in me come and do whatever you want to do in my family come and do what come and change whatever you need to change in my heart today lord i am yours forever how great you are your greatness lord gets my allegiance gets my obedience gets my surrender today jesus we love you and we love to bring you praise in jesus name everybody said amen amen Well, we love you, 11 o'clock service. Thanks for coming to church today. You look well rested. You guys look good in your fall attire. Everything looks great. Pastor Josh is going to come out in just a second and continue our James series. But before that, though, would you just turn around and greet some of the people around you? Get outside of your clique. Say hello.
We believe that planting yourself in the local church is one of the best decisions you could ever make. That's why we created Next Steps, so that you can know our story and we can understand your destiny. We want to better equip you to step and step into the call God has on your life help activate you as a difference maker in our church. And now, you can take the class online. Become a member, join a serve team, and get connected with our church, all from your own device. New Song Church, how are you doing today? You guys well rested today, feeling good? Got that extra hour of sleep? Gave you the opportunity if you wanted to, you could cut your own steel oats this morning. <laughs> Some food sticking to your ribs, you feeling good? Hey, would you help me welcome everybody that's watching online? Church, let them know you're glad that they're tuning in with us. I'm glad that you're, you're with us today. Uh, if you would, do me a favor real quick and, and check in on uh, Facebook or let do some kind of social media post. I don't want you on social media during the service, but right now, I'll give you a moment to let somebody know, I'm at New Song Church, God is moving up in this mug, and it's good, and you need to be here. And if you're looking for a church, I will save you a seat on the Saturday night service. Let them know that, all right? Let them know. I heard today, like we, man, it's crazy, like how packed we have found ourselves. And our first service was the biggest first service we've ever had. Yes, how awesome is that? Kids' classrooms were packed. We still got some room on Saturday, so if you guys need to move and you need to move, I'm telling you, you need to move, uh, move to Saturday. We would love to have you in Saturday service. Saturday service is great. Your, your church, you're done. You can go, you can go get some, you know, get you some ribs. Enjoy your night. Anyway, God's good, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, on that note, uh, uh, if you, you, when you came in, you should have gotten one of these green cards. It's our Heart for the House card. And every year around this time of the year, we, do a, we take up a special offering. It's above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings that we give sacrificially in faith to help the church with expanding and continuing to have a greater reach in our call, which our mission as a church is we want to help people know God, right? And there are people who don't know God. We want to help them to step into relationship with God so they can become who God's called them to be, fully formed followers of Jesus Christ. The reality is not everybody out there knows God. And so we got to make, we got to make room for them. And so this year, I'm really pumped. This is such awesome, exciting news because this year, all of the money that comes in for the Heart for the House offering is going to go towards a down payment to get the construction rolling on our 30 acres, on a building on our 30 acres of land. Now, some of you are going, I didn't know we had 30 acres of land, but we got, we do. We have 30 acres of land. You can see it here. It's awesome, beautiful piece of property out in the Deer Creek area. Uh, that's right across the street from the 4th and 5th grade, the brand new 4th and 5th grade Deer Creek School that was just built. And uh, man, it's, it's just amazing how God brought this all about. Um, a couple years ago, we were in a season at the church where we were at, a, we were at Noah's event venue and we were packing that place out. We were running three services. Our services were packed. We were looking uh, for, for what the next step was. And we were in this weird season where we couldn't find a space because there was this thing going on in the world where marijuana was becoming legal. And so all of these places we would go to, we would find these warehouses, we'd find these buildings, we'd find these different places, and none of them wanted to lease to us because they were all holding out that people, you know, in the weed market, in the weed industry, would, would use their space to grow, to grow pot. So we were kind of in a holding pattern. It was the weirdest, weirdest season. So like, we'd find, like, a, find a grocery store that's been empty for five years, and we're like, hey, we'd like to talk to you about leasing your building. They're like, no, we're not interested right now. We're, you know, kind of holding out for the pot. <laughs> so, so we found ourselves in this place. It's like, what are we supposed to do? And I, I was praying one day and, and, and asking the Lord, like, God, what do we do? Like, we've got to take a next step. I'm not sure what to do. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly. And he says, well, what do you know to do? 
And what I knew to do was this. I knew when God called us to this city, I knew one of the things he showed me early on was out there in that that Deer Creek area. He showed me all this land. I remember driving out there years ago and seeing that and thinking, this is where we're supposed to plant the church. We're supposed to build a campus out here that's going to touch our city and touch the world. And and so I knew that that was in our future. But at the same time, during this season, I'm kind of going, well, buying land doesn't help right now. We need a building. And like... We buy, we buy land, it's going to take us a while to get a building on that land to raise the funds for that. You know, it's going to be years before we can get in there. But God just said, what do you know to do? What do you know to do? And I knew, here's what I knew. I knew we were supposed to buy land out there someday and, and, and build a church. And so, and so I, I just kind of said that out loud in my car. And God said, all right, I want you to take steps and I'll bless the steps that you take. And so we began the process. We started talking to some different men in our church, different leaders in our church, and they started helping us scout out land. And uh, one of the guys in our church came to me. He said, hey, you need to come look at this piece of land. And we went out there and looked at it, and it was just like, this is it. This is, this is the land. This is where we're supposed to be. We negotiated it, uh, got them down to a good price. And in the middle of doing this, uh, another guy in our church, actually Brad Lewis, right over here, gives me a call one day. And he says, hey, I found this building. You ought to come look at this. And it was this building. And, and at that point, this was a warehouse, an empty warehouse. And that side over there used to be a call center. And I remember walking onto this property and walking into this building, and I could just see this. I could see what it is now. I could see it. I, I just knew this is the space. And so we started negotiating this. And so in the pro- so now we're, we're, we're closing on land and purchasing land. And at the same time, we're beginning this process of turning this building into one big building. And we're doing all this on the cusp of a pandemic getting ready to happen. And so I remember finding myself in that season kind of going, Lord, is this, is this right? Like, is this really what we're supposed to be doing? And I remember I was driving down the road one day and I had my son, Gus, with me. And he was 11 years old at the time. And we're driving down the road, and he said, hey, Dad, I had a dream last night. And the moment he said it, my spirit just said, get ready, like I knew something was getting ready to happen. And I was like, okay, well, what was your dream? And he said, well, I had a dream, and me and you were walking around on this land, and we had hard hats on. And I said, Dad, what are we doing out here? And you said, this is where we're going to build New Song Church's campus. And in that moment, I was like, okay, God, I got it. So here, here's what I'm trying to get across to you. This is a God move. Like, this is a God move. And, and we, in order for us, you know, this building has been amazing. We love this building. It has been such a blessing. Uh, we have more than doubled the size of our church since we moved into this building. Like, no joke, it's been incredible to have our own space. But we always knew when we moved into this building, this is the apartment you move into while you're building your house. And the house that we're building is going to be out there on that land for the Lord. And there's a custom-built house that we're going to build out there that's going to help us to do what God has called us to do in a powerful, impactful way that changes the world. I, I, I see that land out there, that campus out there, is going to be a place that touches the world. I'm telling you, it's going to touch the world. In fact, I, I don't, I'm going to let you in on something. God told me early on, we're going to build a campus that can house 10,000 people. Someday. And you may say, I kind of like New Song Church small. Well, get over it, okay? <laughs> we got to reach more people. And so that, that's where we're going. We're not there yet. We're not going to, they're not taking that step next because that would be a leap, but we're taking the next step. And the next step is us building a building out there. And it's going to be so powerful because we can do so much more. You know, as a church right now, we can't all come together at the same time. Because of the limitations of this building, we, you know, we have worship nights and when we have events and we do stuff, we have to consider like we can only get so many people. We have a church that's bigger than what we can house in one service. We want to do, we want to have uh, speakers come in and we want to do concerts and we want to, we want to read, we want to do stuff. We want to have big, huge youth services. We want to do some stuff that just is just impactful for Jesus Christ. And we just, we got to, we got to keep moving ahead. If we're going to stay ahead of the growth that God's already given us, we got to move and we have to move now. So uh, I've met with the elders. We've been talking about this for a while. We've met with architects. We've started laying out plans. Um, we've met with lending agencies and banks. And, and uh, in fact, here's something really good news is the, the banks have given us the green light across the board. They've looked at where we're at as a church, our finances, and they're like, you guys are good. In fact, they've approved us uh, for a building that's well beyond what we actually need. But what we feel strong about right now 
is that we can build a $5 million building out there on that land that will help us. And here's what's amazing. This is crazy. When we build that building out there, that $5 million will get us a building that's more than, well, it's about double the size of this building. So we'll be double the size of our building and we'll get on that. And the, the, the payment for that on a monthly basis is just a little bit more than what we're paying right now for this lease. So it just makes so much sense. So here's what we need to do. And here's what we're going to do with our, with, our, uh, with our finances. The bank, well, here's how it works. We, we raise, they'll give us $5 million if we give 20% down. So we need to bring a million dollars to the table. Now, here's the good news. Because your church stewards our finances well, we don't actually need a million dollars. We need $750,000. How many? That's good news right there. We're already a quarter of the way there. So that's what we're inviting you to be a part of, is to help us with our Heart for the House offering raise $750,000, which will allow us to acquire the loan, which we will aggressively work in the new year to start paying down. We'll talk more about that in, in 2022. We'll aggressively work to start paying that down, but we want to get the ball rolling and get moving on this. And so here's what I'm inviting you to do. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to go home, and I want you to pray, and I want you to ask God, what he would have you do. If you're married, I want you to get with your spouse. And I want you to pray, and I want you to step out in faith. Step out in faith. And listen, I have no problem asking this of you. Because I grew up in a church that was actively building. We were always doing this kind of stuff. I grew up in a church that built multiple campuses, that built camps, that did all sorts of stuff. And so I was always being invited to give, to give sacrificially, to give in faith. And let me just tell you something. Every time I stepped out in faith and obeyed what God told me to do, he always came on the back end with faithfulness and helped me to move to new levels, to new levels of, of, of blessing, to new levels of, of influence, new levels. And I believe that's true for our church. I believe as we build a house for the, for, for the work of God that he's going to build our house. He's going to build your house. So I want you to, 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 I'm encouraging you to go hear from the Lord. And I believe that $750,000 is a lot of money. But if every one of us obeys what God's asking us to do, we'll knock this out. We'll knock it out. So here's what I want to do this morning. And, and here's what will happen. On December uh, 4th and 5th, we are going to take up this, this offering. We're calling it our Heart for the House Break New Ground Offering. And, on that, and that, during that service, we're going to invite you to give your offering, and you're going to actually bring it down, and we're going to, as an act of worship, because listen, giving is an act of worship, we're going to bring our offering, we're going to worship God with it, and we're going to knock this thing out. Can I get an amen? amen? So let me pray for you. I'm going to pray over this offering. I'm going to pray over you that God would speak to you. Then we're going to pray over the message, and we're going to jump into the Word. Sound good? Lord, I am so grateful and so excited about what you're doing. I remember, Lord, I, I, it's crazy. I remember starting in that school with just a handful of people and setting up and tearing down. And, and, and Lord, you've been so faithful to us to find ourselves in this place. You've been so good. And we know you've spoken. We know you've spoken. And so our, our heart is to be a part of what you're doing. We know that this building doesn't just represent a building for us to be able to have services in, but it represents lives changed. It represents marriages restored. It represents a place where kids can grow up in the things of God and learn who Jesus is and what they can do because of what Jesus has done for them. It represents a place where teenagers can invite their friends and their friends can get on fire for God and we can, we can change our schools and our high schools and junior highs and elementary schools and our community can be changed. We, we, we know it represents a place where we can come together and have fun and, 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 and have recreation. And, and, and Lord, so much is represented in this building. So God, we say to you, we ask you to speak to us. Show us what you're calling us and inviting us to do, Lord. And I pray that we would have the faith to step out in boldness and do what you're asking us to do, Lord. And Lord, as we open up your word this morning, I ask that you would speak to us. We know your word is life to those who find it. And so we pray that we would find the life that we need to find in it today, that you would speak to every individual. Holy Spirit, would you ride on these words and would you communicate this message in such a way that it is personal to every person in the room? And God, what we know not, we pray that you would teach us. What we have not, we pray that you would give us. And what we are not, Lord, please make us. We give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, 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 amen. If you have your Bible, James chapter 2, we are in a series on the book of James. We're going to look at the second half of James chapter 2 this morning. Last week, Sarah did an incredible job 
talking about the first half of James. How many of you enjoyed that? That that message was so good. You know how blessed we are to have her. Good Lord, I'm, we're, we really are. Yeah, give give her a hand. That was a great word. And listen, I, just so you know, I don't need you people coming up to me in the lobby and going, "Hey, you better step it up." Like that doesn't do anything for me. Okay. <laughs> I know she's good. I get it. I get it. I get it. She's a strong woman, right? Strong, good. Dynamite comes in small packages. Amen? <laughs> James chapter 2. What we're going to look at today, we're going to kind of unpack some theology today. So get ready. You're taking notes. Get ready to take some notes. And I want to help you to see what James is pointing out here. James is drawing this comparison between these two things, faith and works. Somebody say faith, faith. and works. And he's helping us to understand the relationship that these play in our life. James chapter 2, we're starting verse 14. I'm going to read the whole section to you. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead. Somebody say dead. dead. Being by itself. But someone may, say, may, may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. I love James. He's so awesome. Like, I love the way he puts stuff sometimes. Like, he's like, oh, you believe in God? Cool. So do demons. <laughs> Right? Like, if that's where it ends for you, demonic, okay? <laughs> Look at this. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, <laughs> oh, man, that faith without works is useless? Somebody say useless. useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works without work, or when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. How many of you want to be called a friend of God? That sounds pretty good to me. Verse 24, You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. We're going we're gonna to unpack this. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now, for years, um, this passage of Scripture was looked at and was considered to be very controversial because... A lot of people would look at this and they would say, it, it seems like it contradicts some of the teachings of Paul that talk about how it's by grace through faith that we're saved. And this feels like it's saying that it's by your works that you're saved. Uh, but I'm going to show you that's not really what James was saying here. I'm going to help you understand what's really going on. But there were a lot of people that didn't see that the right way. In fact, uh, Martin Luther, you guys remember him, Martin Luther, the 95th. You know, thesis guy. He actually, um, at one point, called the, the the book of James. He says it was a gospel of straw in the 1500s, and that was like in the 1500s, guys. That was a sick burn. <laughs> so he was saying like this: it, it doesn't hold up. It's not very strong. It's not good because he was he was dealing with a church and a world at the time that was that was a Catholic church that was saying this is all about your works. It's all about what you do, and and so this seemed to go against what he was seeing. In scripture. So, so here's what I want you to see. It's important that we get this. It's important that we understand how faith and works work and that we, we have them working in our life because it is very easy to fall into some ditches related to these things. Uh, in fact, one of the ditches that we can fall into related to works is that it's all about works. That we come to believe that my, uh, my, me being right with God is based on my performance. That if I can do the right things, that I can tip the scales of the favor of God in my favor. And, and you find a lot of people who don't understand the gospel message of Jesus, this is how they think. You go up to them and you say, you know, do you believe in, in heaven? And, and if so, do you think you're going to go and why? They're, they're going to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not like Hitler. Like I'm doing pretty good and I'm trying to be nice. I can't imagine that, that God would send a person like me to hell. Well, what they're saying is, I believe that the, the works of my life 
are, are helping me to win over the favor and the acceptance of God. It's about my works. That's a ditch that people can fall into. The other ditch is that it's not at all about my works. That now, because of Jesus, there's grace, and that because of grace, and listen, there is grace, but a lot of people come to believe because of grace, I don't have to do anything. It doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter what I do. I don't really have to submit to the Word of God. I don't have to try not to sin. It, it doesn't matter. My life is my life. I can, you do you, I'll do me, and whatever. It's, it's all grace. And this, this hyper grace is dangerous, too, because it, it leads to this passivity and this diminished responsibility where we don't recognize, hey, Yes, we're saved by grace, but God's got a role for us to accomplish in this world. We can't just sit aside and, and do whatever we want and, and hope that the gospel message of Jesus is achieved. No, no, no. There's got to be more. And so it's important that we understand the truth because the truth sets us free. And so I want to give you some truth related to these things. Okay, so i got two truths for you, and then we're going to start unpacking them this morning. Here's the first truth. Truth number one is this. Faith alone saves. Faith alone saves. Here's the second truth. But the faith that saves is never alone. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. So let's start with faith alone saves. You with me this morning, New Song Church? I should be getting more, more, more reaction out of you guys. I'll preach faster if you talk to me, okay? Faith alone saves. This is a major theme of the gospel. This is what the gospel is built on. And, and, and so it's important that we, we understand this because what distinguishes the message of Jesus Christ from every other religion that exists out there and every other false gospel that exists out there is this idea that faith alone saves. You know, the, the greatest question of the human heart is the question, how do I get acceptable to God? And in every other false religion and false gospel, they answer that question with one word, and it's do. You got to do. You got to do this, and you got to do that. And, you know, if you do these five things over here, then in this religion, you're, you're good. And over here, if you do these ten things, these ten sacraments over here, then that, that'll make you good. And if you, if you don't, you don't do that. You can't do that. Don't do that. Do this, but don't do that. And don't, don't do this either. So if you do this and you do that and you don't do these things, then maybe at the end of your life you'll find yourself in an acceptable place with God. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is different. It's, it's built on a, on a single word, but that word is not do. That word is done. It's done. The gospel message of Jesus Christ says that Jesus has done what is necessary to make you acceptable to God. That Jesus did the work that you can't make yourself acceptable to God, but because of Jesus, you can be made right with God. It's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done, and that's why it's gospel. Because gospel means it's good news. And the good news is Jesus did the hard part. He did the hard part. And that's what Jesus said at the cross. He's, he's dying. He says, it is finished. The work necessary to make you acceptable God has already been finished by Jesus Christ. So, so here's what God did. God saw you in your sin, and at your worst, he sent his son Jesus to come to this earth and to die on the cross, to live a life you could have never lived on your own, a perfect life, and then to die and take on the wrath that you deserved and the wages that you deserved. And now, through Jesus Christ, we can receive the righteousness of God. You can be made right by God, and you receive it by faith. That's how you receive it. Jesus has already done the doing. All you have to do is receive it by faith. Ephesians 2 says it like this, verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved. Grace means it's unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You could never earn it. You, but, but God gives it to you anyways. He, doesn't, he not only doesn't give you what you deserve, he actually gives you something amazing, grace that you don't deserve. It's by grace that you're saved through Faith. Grace makes it available. The grace of Jesus makes it available. Faith is how you attain it. And then he goes on from there and says this, and this is not of yourselves. It's not something you did. It's a gift of God. Verse 9, not by works. That word works there means uh, you doing something or something that you have to get done so that no man can boast. Paul says it's by grace. It's attained through faith. 
And James comes along in this book, and he actually is agreeing with that totally, totally agreeing with that. In fact, he's speaking to an audience. You know, we've talked about the, the group of people he's talking to, a scattered group of people. And this scattered group he's talking to at this time are Jewish people who have converted to Christianity. And so he's reminding them of their heritage. He points them back to the father of the Hebrew people and how he was actually saved by faith. Look at this, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and this is a quote from Genesis 15, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham believed, that's faith. He believed in who? He believed in God, that's faith. Faith is in God. He believed in God, and it was reckoned to him. Reckoned to him means it was provided to his account. He was given something he didn't deserve. It was reckoned to him. What was reckoned to him? Something was given in his account. What was it? Righteousness. Right standing with God. By grace through faith he received right standing with God. This is the gospel message in the Old Testament. And what does he receive? The right, this righteousness. It's, it's the right standing of God himself. And what James is saying here is, guys, it's always been this way. It's always been about faith. From, from Genesis to Revelation, it's always been about faith in God. See, sometimes we come to believe that like in the Old Testament, it was about works. Because of the Ten Commandments, it was about works. But here's the problem with that. Nobody could fulfill the Ten Commandments. No one could do it. So what did they have to do? In order to be made right, they had to bring a sacrifice. And so once a year, you would have to bring some kind of animal. And innocent blood would have to be shed. And you'd put this animal on the altar, and you'd sacrifice it. You'd kill it, and its blood would run down. And in that moment, you're believing by faith that the sacrifice that you're laying before the Lord covers your sin and makes you right with God. That's the Old Testament. Somebody say, that's old school. New school is Jesus came. God sent Jesus into this earth. And he came as a spotless, innocent lamb of God and was sacrificed on the cross for our sins. Innocent blood was shed not to cover your sins, but to redeem fallen man, to make your sins as far as the east is from the west. And once you put your faith in God and your faith in the cross of Jesus, you are given the righteousness of God by Christ Jesus. You are made right by God. Your sins are eradicated from your life and you're free. Can I get an amen? None of us could have done that, but Jesus did that for us. And now because of Jesus, when God looks at you, he says, done, done because of Jesus. It's done. Second Corinthians 5 21. God made him who had no sin. Jesus fulfilled the 10 commandments. He's the only one that ever did it. Never sinned, never made a mistake a day in his life to be sin, but he took on Sin. He took on your sin. He was made sin. Took it on to the point that his visage was covered in it. He was marred beyond the, beyond the ability to be seen as a human. That's all the sin and sickness and disease of the world was poured out. The full wrath of God, the full cup of the wrath of God was poured on Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. And now because of what he did, it died on the cross with him. And you can be free. That, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. The righteousness of God. Now, just so you know, the way you get your, your, your right standing with God is by faith. And, it, and, and, and you maintain it by faith. Like you don't, now that you're saved, go, okay, now it's about my deeds keeping me right with God. No, no, because your deeds don't make you any more righteous than God Himself. You know, someday when you've been in heaven for a thousand years and you haven't sinned for a thousand years, God's not going to look at you anymore in that moment and say, well, now you're really righteous. No, no, no. You're going to be just as righteous a thousand years in heaven as you are the moment you make Jesus the Lord of your life because you can't be any more righteous than God himself. Faith alone saves. Somebody say, faith alone, faith alone. saves. Faith. Through faith in Jesus, we receive something Incredible. Incredible. And so listen, because we've received something incredible, the faith alone that saves should be followed by something that, ex that, that expresses that to the world. And that's why the faith that saves is never alone. There should be something taking place on the outside that points to the work that God has done on the inside. That's what James is talking about. That's why he says in verse 14, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? 
Verse 17, even so faith, if it has no works, it's dead, being by itself. And verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. You know what the, the word works there means? It means visible evidence of an inward saving faith. I'm going to say it again. Works are visible evidence of an inward saving faith. So your, your works don't earn you salvation. That's by faith. But your works are evidence to the faith that you have for the world around you. Yes. Okay, so to help you understand this, I'm going to give you a little bit of an agricultural quiz, okay? Agricultural quiz. I'm going to put a picture, a few pictures up here on the screen of some trees. And I want you to help me identify what kind of trees these are, okay? So when you see the tree, bet you when you see the tree, I want you to yell out what kind of tree it is. This isn't hard. This isn't rocket science. You people are smart. Look at the person beside you and say... I'm, I'm not smart. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I am smart. <laughs> Some of you, maybe that's what you want to say, and that's fine. All right. So, guys, go ahead. Throw up the first tree. What is this tree? You guys yell it out. One, two, three. It's an orange tree, right? How do we know that's an orange tree? We know because there's fruit on the outside. There's fruit on the outside that points to... What's going on inside? So something displayed. You know what fruit is? Fruit is the work of a tree. There's fruit on the outside that helps us understand the identity of the tree on the inside. Throw up the next one, guys. What kind of tree is this? One, two, three. Banana, Banana tree. How do you know? You guys are so smart. How do you know this? It's not, it's not hard, is it? You know because you can see the fruit on the outside, and the fruit on the outside is evidence to what's going on in the tree. The fruit shows you the identity of the tree. Throw up the next one, guys. What kind of tree is this? This is a, this a lemon tree. I know the coloring is a little interesting. Plus, the lemons are massive. This is where they get the Sam's lemons, I think. You guys ever seen the Sam's lemons? are like cantaloupe. They're huge. But again, how do you know it's a lemon tree? Because there's fruit on the outside. There's fruit on the inside. That's an evidence to what's going on on the inside. Now, throw up that last tree, guys. What kind of tree is this? It's a it's green. <laughs> you don't know. You know, don't know. You know why you don't know? Because there's no fruit. But I'll tell you what kind of tree it is. That's an apple tree. But, but you don't know because there's no fruit. You guys tracking with me this morning? There, there's evidence on a tree what's going on inside the tree when we see the fruit on the outside of the tree. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 12, 33. A tree is known by its fruit. And good works are, are fruit born and grown of a healthy faith. And what James is kind of getting at here is if there's no fruit, is the faith healthy? If there's no fruit, is the faith alive? Maybe it's dead. Maybe it's a dead faith. And Paul agrees with this. Look back at Ephesians 2. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. We read all this. Not as a result of our work so that no man can boast. A lot of people stop right there. Look at the next verse. The very next verse. For we are his. Talking about God's workmanship. You're a work of art made by God. Made, created in Christ Jesus. You've been made, remade, remodeled by Jesus Christ. For, say it with me, good works. You've been created for good works, which God has prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. It's by grace that you're, that you're saved, but now that you've received this grace through faith, now there should be something. There should be a work taking place in you. There should be something going on through you. It says this in Titus 3.8. Again, this is Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want to insist that these teachings, so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. Good should be happening. It should be something we're devoted to. Good works, good fruit should be coming out of our life. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. It is faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. It should be evidenced in our life by a work coming out of our life that says, hey, that person... That person is with Jesus. People should be able to look at your life, and just like we can look at a tree that has fruit on it and go, that's, a, that's an orange tree. 
Somebody should be able to look at your life and go, I'll tell you what that person's about. I'll tell you what they're made up of. I'll tell you who their identity is, is in. It's in Jesus. That's a Christian. I, I, I know it because I see it all over them. I see the fruit. I see the work of their, of their life. So what, is this, what does this look like? What do these works look like? Well, here's what they look like. God's works are the life of Jesus in me being lived through me. See, the moment you make Jesus the Lord of your life, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus comes to live inside of you. And now there should be an evidence of Jesus living in you, coming out of you. And here's what that looks like. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. Nine. The nine fruits of the Spirit. That's the nine characteristics of the nature of Jesus Christ. That should be on display through your life. Now, here's the thing. This is a work that's taking place in you. See, being saved means that God is now changing me. The, the work that Jesus does is, is this, that salvation is not just a moment. There's actually a movement that takes place. Now, at the moment you receive salvation, a miracle takes place. The Bible says you were dead in your sin, dead. Turn to the person beside you and say, you was dead. You were dead. You're, you're, you're not just like, sick. You're dead. And Jesus gives you a brand new born again spirit. You receive that. You're born again. Brand new spirit. That's the foundation. God lays this new foundation. And off of that foundation, he wants to start a remodeling project. And he wants to start working out your salvation into the rest of you. Because how many of you know, <laughs> you get saved, God gives you a new spirit, but doesn't mean everything else changes right away. You're still going to have some garbage in your mind, some garbage in your flesh. That stuff got to get worked out of you. You know, when a remodeling project takes place, there's normally some demo. And demo can be a little ugly. You got to bring out the sledgehammer and some stuff has to get trashed and broken and torn down. And that's some of the work that Jesus, God wants to do if you partner with him. We partner with Jesus to do this work, to work this out. Look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Notice the tense there. We're being transformed. That God's continuing to transform us into the same image. What is that image? It's the image of Jesus. From glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So, so get this. The moment of salvation before God, you, you write. You are made right. You have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus on you in that moment. And now God is working out something in you. And, and the something he's working out in you is evidence to the work he's done inside of you. And it's evidence to the world around you. God is working out in my life practically the righteousness that I already have through Jesus positionally. He's working out practically the position I have in Jesus Christ already. He's working that out. So, so our job, here's our job. We partner with the Lord. We partner in the remodeling project. And we submit to the Word. And we submit to the Holy Spirit. And we allow God to do this work. Listen, God is faithful to complete the work, but He can't complete the work if we don't partner with Him. So we've got to partner with Him in this work. Now, here's what's interesting about this. In, in one way, um, we're all working towards the same project. We're all trying to build the same image. It's the image of Jesus. But in another way, it's going to look different from person to person because we're, all not, we're not all in the same place. We're, some of us are a little bit further in the project. The way God kind of showed it to me this week is it's kind of like imagine that the day you get saved, God comes to you and he says, okay, now every day I want you, I'm going to get, here's your canvas, I want you to paint a picture of Jesus. You're going to paint a portrait of Jesus for the world to see every day. And so, you know, you, you don't know, you, you're going to learn what he looks like, and you're going you're gonna to practice this every day. So you, you know, if you've never painted before, like, you ain't Bob Ross. Like, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so you may, you may not know the image of Jesus really well, so you're kind of generally painting, and you're not real skilled in how you paint. So how I many you know you get done with your painting on that day one, you're going to be like, how's this? And it's not very good. And you're not going to be that great at this. And the tendency is sometimes I think people who are new look at somebody else who's further down the road and we go, man, my painting looks nothing like theirs. 
But what you don't know is they've been doing this same project every day for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And in that time, they've learned more about the image that they're supposed to be painting. And they've gained skill in how to do it. And so now their image is looking pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's looking pretty good. So listen, if you're new to this thing, don't, don't look at somebody else's painting and go, man, I'm so, I got so far to go. You do, but by the grace of God, you can get there. And also, if you're a little bit further down the road, don't look at them and say, God, these, I'm, I've really arrived. <laughs> the, point, the point is this. It's process. And we're all in the process. Or the question is, are you in the process? And, and James gives us a way to gauge whether or not we're really in the process, whether or not our faith is living. And here's how he, here's how he gives us a gauge. He says, how do you love people? A way we can know how, how good we're doing with this is how do you love people? Look at what he says here. James 2, verse 15. He says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food. So this person's desperate. They need help, right? You don't have clothes. You're naked. You're hungry. That's a person in need. And, and one of you says to them, one of you, talking to, talking to believers, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. James says, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. It's interesting how James puts this. When he says, go in peace, that was actually a, a familiar Jewish term of dismissal. It's kind of like we would say, have a nice day. Or like somebody sneezes and you're like, God bless you. Like you don't, you don't really mean much by that. It's just kind of something you say. And then he says, uh, be warmed and be filled. That was actually a way of saying, hey, uh, hope you get some help with that. But that's not me. Like good luck with that. Somebody else should help you, but that's, that's not me. That's a you problem. So he's saying, if there's somebody that comes to you, you see somebody in need, and you have the means to help them, and you're like, have a nice day. Good luck with that. Not, my, not a me problem. That's a you problem. James says, that's useless. John says it like this in 1 John 3, 17. Whoever has the world's goods, you got some goods, you got some, God's blessed you, and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against them, how does the love of God abide in him? It's a rhetorical question, but here's what he's really saying. The love of God don't abide in you. So, so here's, what, here's what we see in this, okay? Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Faith alone saves. So you being right with God is based on your faith in Jesus Christ. But then after you've received this incredible gift of the forgiveness of God by grace, there should be some works that evidence your life to what Jesus has done in you. Because see, the works are not about your salvation. Listen, listen, but they may be about somebody else's. The Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is a hope for some people of a greater glory, of a better life, of a hope, of freedom. Christ in you is a hope of glory. It's an old saying, but it really is true. For some people in the world, the only Jesus that they're going to meet is the Jesus that comes through you. So here, here's what we do. We say, God, you've been so good to me. Man, you've given me something I don't deserve. And because you've given me something I don't deserve, I'm going to give to the world what they don't deserve. And I'm going to allow your work in me to be evidenced through my life. I'm going to love people. I'm going to serve people. I'm going to give of my life whatever it takes because you gave of your life what I needed. I want you to bow your heads. And close your eyes. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The faith God invites us to is a faith that doesn't just talk. That's demonic. <laughs> it's a faith that walks. It's a faith that walks. It's a, it's a faith that's evidenced. So my question is, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you today in this message? Maybe you find yourself in a place today where you're going, man, I, I haven't been doing this really good. I haven't been painting a very good picture. 
I just want to encourage you. That's, that's what the word is for. It's here to course correct. And what do you need to do? What, what, what needs to change? I think there's, there's a few ways that we have to look at our life. One, you need to look at your words. You know, your words are important. You can point people to the work of Jesus in your life through your words. When you share your story, when you tell people how you were saved, when you tell people what God did in your marriage, when you tell people about how your spouse left you and yet God has rebuilt your life and now you, you find yourself in this new place, when you tell people about how Jesus healed you, when you share your story at your school, when you share your story in your workplace, when you quit shying away, when you know you have that opportunity to, to point somebody to the work of Jesus in your life, that you seize the opportunity and let people know, hey, this is, this is just Jesus. Jesus did this for me. I'm no better than you. I just met Jesus. When you do that, you're bearing fruit. You're displaying fruit that points people to Jesus. Your, your works, we talked about your works. Your works should display that Jesus is alive in you, that your faith is alive in Jesus Christ. What does that look like? That means you serve. That means you give of yourself. It means you're willing to do whatever it takes to help somebody else. And really what it all boils down to is what Romans 12 talks about, is our life is an act of worship. That unlike the rest of the world, the Bible says, be not transformed or be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. That we transform our life through the word, through submitting to the word to look like Jesus. And it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual act. Our, our sacrifices and being willing to look like Jesus, it's an act of worship to God. It points people to Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we thank you for this word today. And we want to be doers of your word. We are disciples. And because we're disciples, Lord, we know, we recognize it's our job to be a doer. And so for us, Lord, we recognize that doing means obedience. Doing means that we're willing to do whatever it takes to help other people come into relationship with God. Lord, help us to display the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to display the image of Jesus. Empower us for that. Thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to go ahead and invite our altar ministry team to come down at this time. And maybe you're here today and you've never taken kind of that first step of, of saying, you know what, I, I've never put my life into the hands fully of Jesus Christ. I've never been... I've never like given my life and said, God, I, I need salvation. I have never put my faith fully in Jesus and said, I, I need of the work of the cross in me. And you feel far from God today. You've never asked Jesus to be your Lord. If that's you today, we'd love to pray with you about that. Maybe you're here today and, and you were close to God at one point, but you recognize today, I have drifted. I'm not where I should be. I'm far from God and I want to rededicate my life to Jesus today. If that's you today, we'd love to pray for you. That's what these guys are down here for. Maybe you're here today and you're dealing with some sickness in your body. You know, there, there's a grace for your sickness. It's called the stripes of Jesus. Jesus took stripes on his back so that you could be healed. He made a way so that you could receive of the healing of Jesus Christ. And so if you're here today and you're dealing with sickness in your body, pain in your body, issues, we would love to pray with you. We'd love to join our faith with you and believe that, that God could miraculously heal you or, or speedily help you to recover. Maybe you're here today, you're dealing with some kind of issue in your finances, an issue in your mind, an issue with, with fear, whatever it may be. This is what we say at New Song Church. If it matters to you, it matters to God, right? Whatever it is, don't leave today with a burden. Leave the burden at the altar. We'd love to pray with you today. Would you stand with me, church? We're going to go back into a time of worship. And this is your time. If you're here and, and you have a prayer need of some kind, you want to commit your life to Jesus, you want to recommit your life to Jesus, you need healing, you, you, need, you need wisdom, you just need somebody to partner with you in something. If there's a burden that's on your heart right now, a burden that's weighing heavy on you, don't leave with that burden today. Let's leave it here at the altar. We would love to pray with you. So this is your time. If that's you, you can go ahead and start stepping out towards the altars. But we're going to go back into a moment of worship. And I, I want to encourage you, man, you, you've just heard a message about this incredible grace of God, this forgiveness that we receive. We can be made right. Like you can lift your hands today. And you're not lifting your hands hoping that God will accept your worship today. If you've made Jesus Lord of your life, you're not going, man, I hope God can see past my mistakes. God sees Jesus. He sees you forgiven. So let, let's, let's partake of that today. Let's worship the Lord. Let's, let's go boldly to the throne room of grace and worship. 
Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for the cross and what it represents. Thank you for the opportunity we have to represent you in this world. What an incredible honor that we can point people to the work that's been done inside of us. Help us to work out our salvation. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room right now that has a prayer need of any kind, that you would draw them to your altars to receive all that you have for them. In Jesus' name. going to stay in an attitude of prayer. Our altar ministry team will remain up here. Um, as Pastor Josh said, if it matters to you, it matters to God. So if there's anything in your life that you need prayer for, we invite you to step out of your seat, step out in faith, come up to the altar, let us partner with you in prayer. Um, and our new song cares team, additionally, they'll be in the back with our new song cares lanyards. So if you have anything going on in your life where there is a need, maybe hospitalization or maybe a death of someone close to you, where there is something that we can do to help. Come let us know. We would love to walk with you through that. Um, but what a powerful word from Pastor Josh, that faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. Um, but what a good word. But my name is Eric, and this is my good friend, Dominique. Yes, and there's a very special group of people here that we would like to welcome, and that is our first-time guests. We are so excited that you're here, and our staff wants to know that you are here. So in the seats in front of you, there are these cards. You can scan the QR code on one side or fill it out on the other side and drop it in the offering box in the back. And while you're making your way back there, we encourage you to stop and go see Pastor Josh and Pastor Sarah at our guest central right to the left. They want to meet you, they want to shake your hand, and they want to give you a gift. Come on. Yep, and if you're brand new to New song or you've been here since the beginning we invite you to take part in our new song next steps it's our online membership course it just goes over the vision here new song and what we believe in um, so you can go ahead and register at newsongpeople.com forward slash next and once you complete it we invite you to register for our planet service which will be november 20th and 21st just a time where we get to welcome you pray over you and officially welcome you in as new song members because um, we believe it is powerful and needed to be part of a home church and we'd love to have you part of new song as well and here at New Song, we believe in honoring the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. So if you came prepared to give, you can do that through the many ways listed on the screen right behind me. But one way I want to highlight is through our New Song app. And you can download that at newsongpeople.com forward slash give. You can give on there and see everything that New Song is doing in the upcoming weeks. Come on. And finally, New Song, we believe that God's word is? Powerful. Come on, say it like you mean it. God's word is? Powerful. Our student section knows what's up. Yes, God's word is powerful. And we believe you cannot live a victorious life with a defeated mouth. So we want to declare God's word over our lives. So follow with us on the words on the screen. I am the head and not the tail. I am above only and not beneath. I am blessed coming in and blessed going out. And everything I set my hands to will prosper. Have a great week, everyone.